Welcome back to the hyperbolic dedication chamber. The name has changed because we are dedicated to stopping the developers at Lead Code from wreaking havoc upon our lives. And the way we are going to do that is by solving all the problems. This is a necessary evil, and the way we fight this evil is part of a secret organization called the Hyperbolic Coding Chamber, which is a Discord that you can join with the click of a button. So that is the new wave, and we are back once again with daily lead code. It is unclear what day it is. It is unclear what day it is. So it is day one for question mark. And we are back once again. Also, we hit 1,000 subscribers, 1,000 subscribers. So that's pretty cool. Thank you, everyone, for joining the channel and also joining the Discord. I'm hoping we're all out here grinding, fighting in the Coliseum. Hopefully, one day we will reap the benefits of reaching the top of the Coliseum. And the benefit is hopefully joy. So, all around, a win for everyone involved. But we have some comments here from King Chrome. Kind of a fire, actually kind of a fire profile picture, if I might say so. My name is going to, my, my main, my man is going to feel true suffering when it's time to implement a real world problem, which needs a complete different knowledge base than lead codes. Hey, kind of true, kind of true. But, um, I think it all, I think it kind of, I think it all depends. I think it always, it always depends uh, what one's goal is. Lead code at the in the beginning, uh, when I was doing it two years ago, it was definitely for job opportunities. Now I mostly just do it for fun. I just like to do. I just like to. Basically, we're coming for the international grandmasters. Okay, that's pretty much it. We're coming for the international grandmasters. They've become too comfortable, so we're coming to flip the script. So, yeah, that would be cool. But yeah, I wouldn't say we're. Uh, like dead set on only doing lead code or anything like that more just practice plus i think uh plus i think just having done the problems i think will always be useful i used to have the i i used to i can't say that i'm that much better i'm that much definitely much better than when i started but compared to the people who are grinding these things i'm nowhere near close but it hurts my it hurts my heart to say this but it has to be said, learning these problems and doing these problems and actually reading, you know, these algorithm books and stuff like that, it has actually made me a better programmer. I hate to say it, and I don't think all these interview problems and everything are perfect, and I think the system is definitely a little broken, but to some respect, having to consider all these things or having to know all these time complexities has definitely made me a better programmer. I can't say it's made me a better web developer. I can't say that. But uh, definitely when I program some of my own other things, I definitely see that the familiarity with the formulation or the formula of the leak code problems is very useful. For example, I was reading, what was it? Oh yeah, I think I said this before. I was reading an algorithm on network programming because I was trying to make a multiplayer game and then I was like in the past I remember struggling to understand this but after having done enough problems I was just like oh it's just like this problem and this problem but uh, with a, a hint of this problem and it was just so much easier to understand because I had done those problems before so I think it's a give and take it always also always depends on one's goal 1k subs let's go baby oh that's all right I'm back to the comments 1k subs Let's go, baby. True. You are a god king. That story you mentioned is about Dolly. I don't actually... What day was this? Blue Lock. What was the story? It was a good story, though. If it was about Dolly, it was a good story. Stop saying feel strong, man. Feel strong, man. Nah, I like it. <laughs> There's got to be a medium in here. Feels feels average, man. Nah, feel strong, man. Feel strong, man. On the whole, on the whole thread. Uh, Jason Bourne, good stuff. Thumbs up. Feel strong, Jason Bourne. Also, this is a slightly disturbing profile picture. 
You the dude. Mason Schaefer, what language do you code? I usually use TypeScript. I love, I gotta say it. I know TypeScript has a lot of issues. I know JavaScript has a lot of issues, but let's keep it a buck thousand. It runs everywhere. And at this point, it, at this point, I've seen JavaScript run everywhere. And I think it it's probably the most length. Actually, I don't know if it's the most used. I guess it depends on how you define use, but pretty much every website has to use it in some respect. And also a lot of cool things being done with WebAssembly, Web GPU and all that stuff. So I like JavaScript and I feel like TypeScript makes it, TypeScript completes JavaScript or it makes JavaScript fun. So yeah, I, I then tend to, tend to dabble in the TypeScripts. So consistent. That's you, brother. Ha ha. I, that's a lot of comments today. Ha ha. I love the bold and brash. Oh, true. True. I think they're, wait, is there a, oh yeah, it is. That's bold and brash. <laughs> People who, it's bold and brash right here. <laughs> that's actually a good eye. Good eye. <laughs> that's pretty funny. Uh, and then we have another one. You're right. The novelty situation, novelty situation is hard truth, but the war of art press field philosophy for getting work done prevails every time. That's actually interesting. This book worth the cop. I remember I was, when I, I was trying to figure out, uh, I was trying to find a really good book on why it was so hard to create art. And I think I ran into this book, but couldn't decide if I wanted to read it or not. But it sounds like you've read it. And if you have, I'd love to know if it's worth the cop. But yeah, it's interesting. I wonder if this philosophy has invaded other things because I seem to have osmosis it somehow. Just borrowing it. And then we have feel the rainbow, taste the rainbow. Facts. We can taste it. And the rainbow is what we can taste. And then suffer. And then CJ Christian says suffer best baby. True. True. We, is it is is it worth it if there's no suffering that's the real question that is indeed the real question i've done yeah whenever i look back i feel like uh it being sort of it has to suck a little bit but also it doesn't have to suck completely i would definitely say the first 100 days were the first 100 days was torture the first 100 days was actually suffering but the days after that, the last 44 days or so, or 45, I got to be honest, it's mostly just been fun. So that's why, yeah, that's why I say I'm not uh, necessarily too worried about outcomes and stuff like that. To me, the, the main project was just uh, using Lead Code as a vehicle to train focus. And what we ended up with, which is a pretty cool hobby that we're becoming slightly palatable at, so... Hopefully that trend continues and we can become better at it. I'm sure the better we get at it, the more fun it becomes. At least that's the trend I've noticed. So hopefully that'll be pretty cool. And yeah, it was just interesting because the first 100 days was absolutely torture. Maybe that's just a cheat code. Maybe things are just, maybe things are just, maybe we just like the things we're good at. I don't know, but uh, I'll maybe I'll have to reflect on that. Well, I won't have to reflect on is advising you to join the hyperbolic coding chamber. So you should join it because it's a pretty cool chamber of people who are programming and stuff. So it'd be pretty cool if you joined. Also, we have a surprise guest on Friday. You know what, spoiler alert, the surprise guest is a returning member. It's going to be, uh, we're gonna have, uh, we're gonna have pretty much every top tech executive in the Discord on Friday, just to chill. So you're going to want to join for that because it's going to be pretty crazy. And we're also going to have a surprise guest, uh, Adam Sandler, He's going to be joining the Discord as well. We're just going to be kicking some brewskis. So you're going to want to join the Discord for that. And yeah, that is true. So the final thing to do basically is to return to the problem ones and zeros. We've been on this problem for a little while now. And what's interesting is we're learning a lot doing this problem, but this problem has woken something. I think we're about to go into hyperdrive. I think we're about to start completing problems a lot faster, not for completing it, but because I think I just got an idea 
and it will remain to be seen why when exactly remains to be seen what is when exactly uh, this will pay off but I think it will be soon so summary of the problem you're given an array of binary string stirs and two integers m and n return the size of the largest subset of stirs such that they're at most m zeros and n ones in the subset the set x is a subset of y if all elements of x are also elements of y. So here we have stirs, we have this array of strings, right? We have m equals 5 and n equals 3. Right? So we're saying we can have at most five zeros, right? And at most, I should actually just zoom in here. We have at most five zeros and we can have at most three ones. Now the largest subset you can create and you can only each you can only use each of them once is by going from one to zero then we'll have four zeros and three and two if you grab these two you have four zero four zeros and three ones left and two ones left right then you can go to this one you'll have three zeros and one one left and you can grab this one which means our largest subset is index zero one and uh, three and four. So these two, these two, so the output ends up being four. Now there's tons of other valid, but there's smaller subsets. We want to max. We want optimality here. And yeah, it makes sense that a greedy algorithm already wasn't going to work because we're trying to maximize something. So, or you wanted optimality, and a greedy doesn't always lead to optimality, but usually leads to a palatable solution. So here we have another one. We can have at max one zero and one one. So the pretty much the way to get the max number of elements is to take zero and one. So we get an output of two. If we take this one element, we end up with a subset of size one, which is not optimal because we want the largest subset of stirs such that they're at most M zeros and one and ones. Now our constraints. We have uh, always have at least one string, and the length of the string can be from one to one hundred. And our digits are zero and one. So we've done a lot of things. We try to do some array magic. We try to agree solution. The ideal solution is DP based, but I think the cheat code is that a lot of DP problems can be formulated as shortest path on a DAG. So that's kind of what we're aiming for. And the graph here is going to be implicit. The secret sauce that also remains to be seen is how we should weigh the edges. And I think what we're going to do is to aim for is with an implicit graph. So here we have Dijkstra's. So for each vertex, we had an issue because what we originally went for is with an undirected graph, which Dijkstra's does work on an undirected graph. I mean, oh, we had a fully connected graph and I think Dijkstra's does work on a fully connected graph. It's just that the solution ends up being a little bit useless because the shortest path from S to every other vertice is just, actually it may not be shortest path may not just be taking that 
actually, yeah, the shortest path. Yeah, I think it can work actually. But anyways, we switched it to a DAG. We're switching it to a DAG now. Except to make it acyclic, uh, it can't be fully connected. Anymore. So now we're making it directed. But it's unclear how we should make it directed. Directed. So one way we're doing that is we're taking a set of. Uh, there's two things we're doing. Instead of making so that you can choose from any edge, or instead of making it fully connected because you have the option to visit any vertex. So, um, the vertex is where it's possible to move the edge we choose. So there's two things we're doing. The first one being that we're reducing the possible number of edges by we're choosing the possible number of edges to choose by by seeing whether or not it's even possible to travel to that edge and not break the M and N rule. But then the edge we choose is gonna be the one of least cost. The way we've given cost is pretty much by So we're figuring out our potential vertexes that we can choose from. And we're doing this by pretty much going over all the potential paths, right? extracting the zeros and the ones and seeing, okay, we have a cur M and a cur N, which is really just uh, the M and N that it's given to us in the problem. And the cost or the weight is given by subtracting the zeros of the, the starting vertex, the starting vertex and seeing if it's possible to be able to even have an edge to another vertex and the output is the possible vertexes. So an example is here in the console, if we start with this as our input string, right? We have five M and three N. If we do one and one minus M and N, it means we should only be able to visit strings that have at most four zeros and at most two ones. What that should mean is that this string here should not be a possible edge for us to visit. If we check with output, we see that our possible vertexes are two, three, and four. Zero, one, two, three, four. Which is not what we want, actually, now that I'm seeing it. Well, zero, one, two, three, four. So let me actually print 
cur m and cur n. Yeah, so we should only have at most four zeros and four one and, and uh, two ones. Oh, four zeros and two. Wait, four. Yeah, four zeros and two ones. And now I'm realizing. We messed up here because this should be zeros and this should be ones. Now we have the correct answer, which is one, three, and four. So now those are our possible edges, so our neighbors. And now we still want to use Dijkstra's, so now we need to take a look at um, uh, updating the distance of vertexes we have a shorter path for. So do that we just say can actually just do four const W of edges that would give us the index um we want the weight of the edge which is really just Really just calc weight. All right, and the weight to the edges will change based on how uh, what's possible what the, the vertex is this uh, node can actually choose from. And then we have, uh, we'll need to get the zero. I should have made a shorter function for this. We'll change this to W. And then we'll have W zeros and W ones. Now we can say right is now we're currently at node zero. Okay, we have the options to choose between one, three, and four, all of which have a distance of infinity right now. So we're iterating through them. We're going to say, hey, do we have a shorter path for zero zero one? Right. We want to update the path for or update the distance from start for each vertex that um, we have a better path for. So if we say distance sub w, which is max infinity, right? Is it greater than uh, distance sub v, right? Plus weight, and it is, right? So we should be able to replace that edge with this value here will say distance of w is going to be equal to distance of v plus weight and then parent sub w will become v <clears throat> so we pretty much should update all these with a particular value which should be um if the first one takes away four if we have four and two to choose from then that means the weight of this one 
would be zero, I think. We have four minus I oh, know it would be four plus two, which is six minus four is four, and then six minus one is five, six minus one is five. So we end up choosing this node here, and then we should end up choosing this node and this node, which actually isn't the optimal path that we're looking for, but it should give us a palatable solution. Now we want to choose the next unprocessed vertex with shortest distance from start, because we're technically still doing shortest distance we should end up choosing zero zero one actually yeah because its distance would be two then we check its neighbors so this looks a lot better we end up having false for the one in the center because it shouldn't be possible as a path to get there. Now, if we were to follow Now, if we follow not exactly a path, So now I think this is better. Now I think we should just be able to switch what we're maximizing from shortest path to longest path. Because right now, right, the edge we chose was zero, right, when we should have chose a different edge to go to. So I think we should just be able to flip a couple things. 
because we should we're updating the neighbor neighbors with the distances right Uh, within the neighbors with distances we have a better path for but better means a shorter path
I think all that we should have to change is infinity to negative infinity. We'll change this line because instead of uh, updating the distance, if we have a path, if we have a shorter path, we want to update the distance if we have a longer path. So pretty much swap these and say if distance sub v plus weight is greater than distance sub w. Or I guess you could keep them the same and just change if distance sub w is less than distance of v plus weight, which is the same thing. Or And then instead of choosing the next unprocessed vertex with the shortest distance, we'll choose the next unprocessed vertex with the longest distance. So we'll start dist at negative infinity. And if dist is less than distance of W, then we'll say, okay, this is now our greatest distance. Right? We'll say V equals W. Then we'll keep going. If we find another one that we're less than, well, then that will now be our shortest. So our parent tree is messed up because the graph is cyclic, I think. Wait a second.
Oh, never mind. Something is awry. I don't think we have a dag. So one more thing we could add to this is that the vertex hasn't already been processed. But then I don't see how we end up with optimality here. We may have something here. One way to test this is if I change the start vertex to index one instead of zero for case three, we should get a good answer. Two, three, four, four goes to the next one, and then you're done. One, two, three, four goes to four, zero, one, two, three, four, four goes to three, zero, one, two, three, three goes to one. Negative one, so we don't add one. So we do add one. If we go up.
I think we could have solved it. So I think, like we said in the beginning, I think we might end up with n cubed. Far worse, because we're doing a lot of stuff here with the zeros and the ones. But I think... Uh, we might be able to abstract this out. If I replace this function name, bring this all the way down here, this is what we actually call it. We can change this here to Dijkstra's. And will always be the same. And then we can change the start vertex. And then we'll do so dot log stirs m and n zero. And what it should return is the longest path. To do that, we'll have to iterate over the parent array basically. So Oh my God, this is so bad. There's no way. If we over the parent array. is a tree we just want to know the longest one so we don't actually okay this is actually not that bad all you have to do is iterate through the tree we'll let ct equals one Not as simple as that either. Or in the parent array. When should we start at zero? When should we start at one? We should add one because the node we're following it up. But now I'm just gonna count how many are not in how many are in there. I think we should just be able to count it and add one if we found at least one. So we'll select count equal to zero. And we'll just say four const num of parent. If vertex is not equal negative one, we'll do CT plus equals one. No we'll return is if CT is greater than or equal to one, 
then we'll return CT plus one, otherwise we'll return zero. This should pass for the first, maybe for these three. I don't know, it should pass for the first two. It should pass for the first two. No, actually it should pass for just the first one. Right. And then to get the actual answer, we have to do is set max equal to negative infinity. And we're going to need a special case for when the stirs is equal to uh, length one. I plus plus. And we'll say max is equal to the math dot max of max and Dijkstra's, and instead of zero as a start vertex, we'll pass an i, then we can return max. I'll remove. Got three. This is one thousand one. This is saying zero, one, two, three. This is saying if you start at this one, one, zero, zero, one, then you have seven zeros left and one, one left. You can go to this one. But you can't go to this one, too.
think you have to. You know what? We might still have to do what we said earlier. I tried to treat this, you know what? I think we have to go through the parent array. The problem is this algorithm is, is the time complexity would be crazy here. Find the vertex with the longest path. I mean, the tree. And good path. So here we'll do pretty much the max path that we can get. Uh, 
um, which is a number index, which is a number and return. And pretty much we're going to say let's see t equals zero. And we're going to say while parent sub index does not equal negative one and m is greater than or equal to. So it might be easier if we do it like this, right? And then we'll say if we'll do zeros, ones, get zeros and ones for stirs. The index itself. So if we look at a parent array, we don't want to use the part at one, we want to use literally the fourth index. So this is where we're starting index here, then Say if m is m minus zeros is greater than or equal to zero, and m n minus ones is greater than or equal to zero. Then m minus equal zeros, n minus equal ones, count plus equal one. And index equals parent sub index now. And then we can set it earlier, we can do CT if CT is greater than zero. We'll do CT plus one, otherwise we'll return CT.
three zero I think what we're seeing is that this algorithm doesn't work. I think I see what's going on here. I think it depends on if we can't just blindly add one. It depends on if that last index, for example, here, three, one, one, two, would make us go out of. So instead of doing this we can keep CT and just do one more case we'll say parents of index is not equal to negative one it means we have one more and so we'll just see if that comes up pretty often we should it should come up pretty often I th oh maybe not I oh, don't no, yeah it should in case Three. Oh no, I mean, if it, wait. Oh, not parents of index, if index does not equal negative one. No, wait, that doesn't make sense. I'm trying to catch that last point where the index goes into one that says negative one. Index equals parents of index.
Wait a second, let me print index. How is this not going out of bounds? Well, because we're following the tree up. I know the code just turned red. It still runs though, so. Yeah, I don't get why my code is red. Hmm. I'm having just a little bit of difficulty. Case two, where's the result? one and the value at the index is negative one I see I think we just need to do it one more time, basically. <laughs> yeah, this is crazy, bro. We got TLE on the second test case, which is crazy. Oh, brother. I think we lost... I think we lost it.
let me see if I can add the test case real quick for that one that failed. I think it's one 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 zero one. Then it's one zero zero one, and then and then m is equal to nine. The other one is equal to five. Yeah, I have to go, but I think what we're doing here is all over the place. So I'm thinking of what we're, we're trying to do is like a all pairs longest path thing. So get path a time complex and especially running it for each index in parent is crazy. There's got to be a better way to know the longest path through the parent array. So we'll look into that and we're going to wrap up today.